You may know them for their wood glues, but did you know Titebond also has a complete selection of construction adhesives? Designed for a variety of applications, Titebond's adhesives make any building or home improvement project a breeze with their high-performing and durable formulas. These adhesives are trusted by the professional, providing squeak-free subfloor installations, long-lasting retaining walls, and even fastener-free feature walls. Check out Titebond's construction adhesives at tightbond.com, including their newest award-winning adhesive, Tight Grab Plus. But I don't think that's widespread enforcement throughout the country. There's no HVAC contractor that wants to fail one of those tests, so it's raised their own standard because they keep getting tested and when they fail, they have to go back. So they realize that it's better for them to do it up front. Welcome to the Fine Home Building Podcast, our weekly discussion of building, remodeling, and design topics aimed at anybody who cares deeply about the craft and science of working on houses. I'm Senior Editor Patrick McComb. Today I'm joined by Fine Home Building Senior Editor Brian Pontalillo. Hey everyone. Fine Home Building Editorial Advisor Mike Gurton. Hello there. And our producer Andres Semaniego. Hey. Please email your questions to fhbpodcast at finehomebuilding.com. <clears throat> you can find previous podcasts and check out the no no show notes at finehomebuilding.com slash podcast. Great to see you guys this morning. Thanks for being here. Thank yeah. you. Oh my gosh. We Hold on, folks. We got an amazing show for you today, and uh, I can't wait to talk to you all about it. Uh, Mike, just briefly, we, we have another discussion we want to have in our check-in. Uh, mm -hmm. You've been doing a lot of site work, and uh, your place looks amazing. Well, thanks. Um, you know, it's it's always nice to start with, you know, good bones and just keep making it better and better and better. And so the last couple of weeks has been I've been outside in the backyard just re-sculpting, sculpting the the, the uh, contour of the land so I can get the, the water to drain away from the house instead of towards the house. And part of that will be a, a patio in the backyard. So, yeah, I've had a I blew out the front tire on a the micro backhoe that I had, <laughs> overloading the bucket with some crushed stone and, and then turning the wheel a little too sharply and the sidewall blew out. But there was already damage to it, so it wasn't entirely my fault. And, uh, Do they yeah. ding you for that, Mike, if, if you uh, flatten the tire on a machine? Well, you know, that's the thing. Most of the rental companies, they offer you the, uh, it's like the collision damage waiver yeah. for, for uh, rental cars. <laughs> And uh, so I, you know, pay the whatever it is at three, four, five percent more, and it's just peace of mind because everybody beats on that equipment, and you don't know when the damage somebody else did previously is going to evidence itself while you're using. You know, think transmission and people jamming gears, and there might be one fractured, you know, part on a one tooth on a spline and you just happen to be the unfortunate person that when that spline finally breaks off uh, that tooth breaks off and now you own a transmission so yeah nope. i'm sure even I a just, tire is hundreds right so yeah it could get probably expensive quick. Yeah. yeah so i just yep guy said yep you got the you got the the uh whatever it was waiver and you're all set so yeah it was checkout was like five minutes <laughs> just check to see if there was full of fuel and that was it you heard it, folks. Give me the insurance. That's what Mike says. Yeah, yeah. You know, when, uh, when we were building this house, um, we, had, we, had, um, we didn't have one issue the whole time with anything happening on our site. We're in a rural area where, um, you know, on a pretty quiet road. Um, the, the, only, the only thing um, that surprised me that happened on the site was when I had a piece of rental equipment someone spray painted graffiti on the door some no. some lo local kid must have come by with this spray can and decided to spray paint some graffiti on the door and um for whatever reason um the rental company did not ding me for it so uh that was maybe maybe they're used to that kind of thing maybe it was easy enough to clean off I'm not sure but thankfully they didn't uh they didn't ding me for that repair so you got tagged your heart must I got tagged <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that must have Andres, really have you upset ever... you when you saw it. I'm sorry, Mike. No, I said that must have been really upsetting when you saw it. It was like, oh my gosh, now what? Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Andres, have you ever rented heavy machinery? 
uh, let me. I I rented the ones, the lift ones, you know, for like the high ceilings. I rented those. Other than that, I just rented like a small equipment. Like I needed to um, to redo the the flooring, the concrete floor of a garage. I rented the machine to like um, send send all the 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 goof away. Other than that, uh, the jackhammers. I rented those, but other bigger than that, <laughs> no, I haven't yet. <laughs> well. I still quite take, a bit. take advantage. Figure out a project because it is super fun. Yeah, Mike, I just got to ask you one more time, uh, briefly here, once more. Uh, the the electric jackhammer, breaker hammer that you're using in that photograph you sent me earlier. Uh, do you mm. want to talk about that? Because I think folks would be interested to know your experience with that machine. Well, first off, it's a Harbor Freight, <laughs> so it's like a quarter of the cost of you know like a professional unit. But I knew. I only needed it for like like a dozen things around you know, the, the house. I wasn't going to need it for a ton of things, but I needed one. And uh, when I figured out the rental cost, it was going to be cheaper to buy one for like 450 or 500 bucks. So, because they rent for about a hundred dollars a day. And uh, yeah, it's just, it's like, well, it's, it's a breaker hammer. It's not a jack hammer, which uh, is smaller and usually pneumatically or hydraulically operated. Uh, it's heavy. It's 85 pounds, but it just busts through concrete slabs. And where I really needed it is busting through ledge. Um, there's a lot of uh, fractured granite around here, so I can just carve that stuff up in seconds. Oh, works great. Is it new? Have you had this a while? I've had it a little over a year, and I've used it to do any number of things uh, around. Everything from you know busting up a small foundation, busting up a slab, busting up the uh, the outdoor grill thing that you saw the photo of, where I could hop up on top and just that thing was gone in 10, 15 minutes. Whereas if I was out there with a sledgehammer, I'd have been out there all day just whacking at those blocks and the mortar joints to break it up. If you all are listening out there and have experience with Harbor Freight tools, I am very curious about that stuff. I stay out of that store because I know I'll spend money I shouldn't be spending. So, uh, <laughs> But I'm sure a lot of folks wonder, is this stuff uh, up to snuff? And you would say at least for occasional use, I'm guessing you'd say this thing is anyway. Yeah, and that's where I make the judgment. You know, if I'm going to be using a tool year after year after year after year, um, it's something I want, a regular professional tool that's going to last a long time. When it's something that I know I only need for smaller operations occasionally, I'm willing to take that risk of something that isn't quite as durable, maybe, perhaps. Um, you know, I have things like a like a, a hand truck. I mean, a hand truck, to me, it's a hand truck, a hand truck, a hand truck, so I got the, the Harbor Freight one. Whereas if I'm buying, a you know, an impact driver that I'm going to use and I want it to be quiet and be able to count on the company to support the battery platform, you know, then I'm going to look to something with a more of a name brand. So, yeah, works out. Andres, Brian, do you guys have any uh, Harbor Freight tools? I don't. I don't, I don't think I've bought any uh, power tools from Harbor Freight, um, but I have bought a few. I'm inspired by Justin Fink, who wrote about a little pulse saw from Harbor Freight that <laughs> cost like seven dollars that he really loved um i bought i bought that so i think i bought um i went there's a harbor freight not far from um where, where we live patrick um in brookfield and I, I bought uh two of those saws and a couple other hand tools there and you know uh the way justin described that saw is just working really well and like because it's i think it was seven or nine dollars you you know you don't you're not concerned about it the way you would be a really nice you know a nice pull saw and so I and I just toss that thing around I throw it in my tool belt I use it to finish cuts or nip something off here and there it's got some kinked teeth now but it still just does the job that I'm looking for it to do which isn't you know cutting dovetails um, so you know I've got a couple of hand tools and they've, they've all worked out fine especially for the not that you know not that I love throwaway things but for the money they've all worked out and I, I think I, I don't think I've thrown any of them away yet I have uh, wrenches in uh, deep well impact metric sockets, and this stuff's been fine. It doesn't have the same precision of fit as higher quality stuff, but sometimes you don't need that, and uh, it's a, a, like a tenth of the price of real mechanics tools. So, mm. Well, Campbell, one of our regular listeners, uh, sent us a, 
link to an article that I thought was really pretty well done, uh, and I'll put a link to that on the podcast page if you all want to check it out. But it talks about the uh, state of the HVAC industry, specifically uh, the lack of training amongst technicians. And uh, Mike, you had thoughts on that. Do you want to go first? Um, sure. Do you want to just give a summary of that 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 piece that that Campbell sent us? Before um, I, I would my... say that uh, it describes first uh, a reporter's experience having a, a technician uh, come to his house to uh, install uh, air conditioning, right, on his uh, e existing furnace, as I recall. And uh, this gentleman, this reporter, had uh, done some work in, I believe it was the weatherization business, and had some familiarity with uh, upgrading HVAC equipment. And he asked the technician uh, if the new <laughs> unit would be able to communicate with the old one, and the technician said uh, that it would, it would be able to communicate and it would just know that there was new equipment attached to the uh, blower motor, and I'm guessing would increase the speed accordingly for air conditioning. Um, but, yeah, is that a pretty good synopsis, Mike? That introduces it, and then, yeah. and then the, uh, the author, Jesse Smith, goes on to describe, you know, the, the, the problems with, that he sees with the HVAC industry and um, then some... some recommendations um, and that you know how widespread the problems are um, that that we've talked about any number of times uh, it's focused on residential I think uh, a, a, a bit of what the article uh, covered would it kind of leaned a little bit to me anyway towards the commercial side of things but uh, it the art the article made me frustrated <laughs> in two ways one was that the so some of the solution i mean the solutions we all know it's it's workforce development encouraging new people to come into the workforce and then it comes to you know like just following basic installation practices and standards which are outlined and that some of the culprits in why those don't get fulfilled are you know the the attitudes amongst both clients and just general contractors i guess though he didn't explicitly say it that they're not knowledgeable a lot of us aren't knowledgeable at, about hvac so that we don't understand when something's running properly or improperly um and then uh enforcement uh in part and then training um and it so one part of it made me frustrated that yep there's a problem out there and the other part is that uh just some of the I think the the article goes a, a leans in some directions that I don't think are going to be useful solutions. I, I it, honestly I think the only single solution because you can't you can't lead people to want to uh, appreciate good quality from a customer standpoint, and you can't. Um, just encourage contractors to do it right. I think there needs to be really, really strong enforcement. And I think mm -hmm. a, a big part of that is third party uh, enforcement. I've been involved in high performance building for a long time. And so I've seen just what the author uh, mentions in that the, the HVAC guys, when they come out and you give them a question, they've got some harebrained answer like, the system just knows when it's connected to a, another part that it will automatically recognize it and then do what it's supposed to do, like that, that, that there's this AI already built into it, which is not the case. Um, but when I, when I see things work properly, um, one example he gives of, of poor HVAC is in duct leakage and that he's never seen uh, a system or very rarely see systems that are sealed properly uh, before they get commissioned or, or installed, and then it's only afterwards that the uh, that the ductwork needs to be discovered that there's leakage problems, and then those can be rectified. Um, where I live in southern New England, I think most of the states nearby and in my state of Rhode Island, we can't get an approval for a new installation on uh, uh, HVAC without having a, a third-party duct leakage test done. So the contractor, the HVAC contractor, has to have a third-party testing group come in and do a proper um, duct leakage test, and then they certify it as meeting that building code minimum, or maximum, I should say, maximum leakage allowed, and then they can move forward with the installation. Uh, but I don't think that's widespread enforcement throughout the country. 
Um, and it works really well. And there's no HVAC contractor that wants to fail one of those tests. So it's raised their own standard because they keep getting tested. And when they fail, they have to go back. So they realize that it's better for them to do it up front. And I think the same thing could happen with um, just the general design and other installation uh, uh, details like having a real J, uh, manual J done, whereas as the author describes in the article, a lot of times uh, the inspectors who are looking at these manual J's that might be submitted, they aren't actually checking to see that it matches the house that it's going to. So they just see, oh, piece of paper with numbers on it. Okay, put it in the file and then don't verify it with a site inspection. So again, I think uh, uh, have, it, it sounds terrible to say, but enforcement can work. And if they required that a third party, because the local building departments usually don't have the staffing to be able to do all the evaluations or the knowledge to do that, to have a third party uh, that the contractor pays for. And it's only, you know, a few hundred dollars and then it's qualified. And then that in turn can be, uh, you know, relayed to the homeowner. Hey, this has been third party checked, verified. You've got a, a good system, good installation. It's something you can count on. I know I've, I've bloviated a bit about this, but... <laughs> Well, it's an interesting it's, thing, and I don't necessarily think uh, enforcement uh, is is the is the one solution because I've heard of uh, situations where uh, people fudge numbers, and unfortunately, the uh, you know code officials who were charged with enforcing uh, you know the quality of construction are simply not knowledgeable, and I wouldn't expect them to be uh, knowledgeable enough to interpret uh, doc testing and a manual J's to know if they're you know, being fudged. And uh, I, I think that That's the weird. trade has to elevate its own standards. Like lawyers and doctors and other professionals have industry standards that they must adhere to. And, uh, you know, if, I think if we could do something with craft and trade work, uh, it would be <laughs> helpful. You, you're shaking your head. I've, Why? I've, 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 been, I've been at it for 30 years. I mean, maybe, okay, give it another 50 years. Maybe the industry will self... <laughs> will self-correct, but I've been doing this for 30 years, watching eight, I learned, you know, about well, back in the late 80s, yeah, so over 30 years, and and I just, time after time, I just see the same things happening, which is why I'm fortunate in where, well, yeah, I could go on and on, but I don't, it, it, it's not the local official that's, like, I agree with you that it's difficult for the local officials to have the expertise and the time to be able to do those those checks, but having the local official require a third party that does the testing. And I think that's where in a, in a lot of contractors and homeowners don't want to go to the expense, but uh, even on projects that I've worked on where we've had uh, a mechanical design done for a house by a mechanical engineering firm. And then that firm comes out and checks to make sure the HVAC guys have done it right. So right up front, instead of the HVAC guys being uh, Prosec judge uh, being the police, the jury, the, the, the prosecutor, doing everything themselves. Here you've got the, the, somebody designing it who's hopefully they're the professionals. Then you've got the HVAC contractor following what the design called for. And then the, the engineering firm coming out to just verify. And there's, they can do it pretty simply. It doesn't take a lot to do verification. It's just looking at what, how things were done at different, you know, different stages, a rough-in stage, and then on the completion and commissioning stage. And during that commissioning process, if the HVAC engineer does the commissioning or at least assists with the commissioning, then they can see that everything's done right. And it, it, it I mean, I, you, as a contractor, I'm putting my trust into that third party, but from what I've seen and what I know from taking lots of classes on installations of HVAC equipment, both uh, the, on the, uh, the air delivery side, water delivery side, and on the equipment side, I can see that they're checking all the boxes uh, on, the, on, the, on the, the checklist of things you've got to ch verify. Anyway, again, I can go on and on and on. But. Well, it's a, it's a super interesting uh, conversation, and uh, I, I would conclude by saying that you know, part of the problem is the HVAC business is a new uh, trade, uh, it, relatively speaking. We've been doing plumbing for, you know, uh, I think you could say 150, maybe 200 years. Uh, HVAC really in its uh, modern 
uh, since uh, only started being mainstream in the in the maybe 50s, 60s, and the equipment has changed dramatically in the last two decades, and uh, it's we're clearly not this doing is, a good job training people. Well, you know, there's there's one sidebar to this, which is that, and I, I speaking with someone who's been in the industry for many years and done research on it. Um, when you go back to like the 1920s, 30s, and even into the 40s, the cost of a heating system, because there weren't really any air conditioning system, but a heating system, heating plant for a house was one, roughly one third, one quarter to one third of the cost of the new house. Imagine that today. Today it's running about like what, 5%, 6, 8 maybe mm. percent. And if you made it a third of a percent, uh, one third of the cost, I mean, um, that would put the cost of a system in the $100,000 plus range, which is not what we're really paying. I don't think homeowners would accept that. It, it, it would be a big burden on the cost of a house, but it would certainly, uh, if you put more money into it and, and the HVAC guys were getting paid, uh, it wouldn't uh, undercut, they wouldn't be rushing through things to try to do things as economically labor-wise on their end or equipment-wise on their end to get something installed that will just work. And that's usually all there. And we're asking more equipment. of that equipment, right? In the, in the third of the house price, you were talking about heating plant only. Now we're expecting air conditioning and air filtration and, you know, uh, yeah. fresh air in, you know, introduction. Yeah. yeah. Well, if you all have thoughts on the HVAC industry or anything, I hope you write in because we always enjoy uh, hearing from you. Just like Jonathan, he says, hey, FHB podcast team, thanks for the thorough discussion. And excuse me, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, this comes from uh, Campbell, who sent this article, and thanks for that, Campbell. He writes, uh, every now and then you all folks read an email from someone who expresses their appreciation for giving them the wherewithal to tackle DIY jobs. I'm not sure I've ever explicitly said so, but as an FHB subscriber for probably going on 15 years, I owe you that. This was a job I did in 2018 that I couldn't have taken on with, without the truly expert advice from the magazine. Also, yes, that is a softwood, a Douglas fir flooring in the kitchen. It matches what was there originally, and it matches the rest of the house and could be uh, installed, by, uh, in, installed in such a way as to accommodate the out-of-flatness inherent to a 130-year-old subfloor. Uh, yes, it's slowly getting a little dinged up, but that's fine. It adds character. Campbell, thank you for writing in. And your floor is beautiful. I love Douglas fir. Folks have heard me say it. What do you guys think? It's a nice kitchen, right? Yeah, I think uh, I think he's doing a, a great job. It looks awesome, and I have a softwood floor too. So uh, you know, um, I, I I appreciate the the um, not only do I have a softwood floor, um, but I chose to uh, oil it, Campbell. So um, I have the, one of the least durable floors in the world, um, and you know, we just decided to uh, we just decided to accept that you know, accept that it, this is a floor that would patina. And hopefully, you know, you know what, what happens, I think, at first is that you get a few dings or a few scratches and, and it feels awful. And over time, it just, it becomes the look of the floor. That's, that's, that's what I tell myself. Um, I'll, I'll let you know if in 10 years, you know, we're moving all the furniture from the living area into the bedrooms to refinish and polyurethane the, the floor one half at a time. We'll see. But, uh, yeah, I think that's worth pointing out is uh, decisions that can be changed later. I don't know if that's yes. ever a bad idea, right? You can decide to finish that floor later. Absolutely, yeah. Um, Jonathan wrote in earlier, uh, uh, and we discussed his uh, hardwood floor installation in, on his basement slab in uh, episode 587, and I'll put a link to that on the, on the podcast page. Uh, Jonathan writes, uh, thank you for the, your thorough discussion in 587 on, in the after show on installing hardwood flooring on concrete in basements. Um, carpet and padding. So I asked Jonathan what was on his floor now, which was an answer we didn't have in our uh, original conversation. And it turns out he's got asbestos tile, uh, mm. uh, vinyl composition tile, I guess, uh, and the asbestos uh, is in the tile itself, not in the adhesive, which is sometimes the case. <clears throat> and uh, I asked him about uh, doing a, uh, a test to see what the vapor transmission 
was because I think you guys would agree that we decided that was an important part of this conversation. And he taped a piece of plastic on the floor and didn't get any fogging, so uh, he has concluded it's fine. But uh, he's also in, uh, I believe, Minnesota, so I'm not sure that the vapor transmission would be as great in the wintertime when a lot of the groundwater is locked up uh, in frozen soil, but I might be wrong about that. Mike, do you have a, th a thought on that? Am I on the right track? You I, don't know. I think you are, but, but yeah. I'm not sure. It, so, say, everything's so site-specific. You know, if he has a, a low water table, in other words, he's way above the water table and there's a lot of gravel, the air might just evacuate most, the air in the soil might evacuate most of the moisture and it may not have a problem at all could be of just a naturally dry basement, which is fortunate. And so I think we stand by our, uh, you know, uh, installation guidelines, which was to check fine home building uh, for some assembly uh, instructions and, uh, you know, see what, it, what, uh, what, what can be done and based on a, either this fogging test or more ideally a calcium chloride test, which is, I think, a little more conclusive. And I would also do it in the wettest time of year to see if that is uh, of a concern. While he was uh, corresponding with me, he pointed out another problem, and um, he sent some photos of that that I'll include in the podcast page. He said, there's a ledger slash support beam above a sliding patio door that is directly beneath a sliding patio door above that walks out onto a deck. I thought there might be a mold or rot issue, but poking the boards yields solid-sounding boards, and the fungus doesn't seem to be damaging the wood. So uh, there's like a little air leak, and it looks like some mushrooms are growing around it. Is that a fair description, Brian? Uh, yeah, I think so. And uh, he, he suggests the gaps between the boards leak a substantial amount of air. So the only thing I can think of is that due to the air leakage and the moist air leaving, the fungus can grow. Although who knows if this grew and halted years ago. Uh, I would love an, any and all feedback on this issue since it now seems to be the most pressing one. I'll respond with more pictures and info that I have. So I think this is clearly an air leak and it's created a uh, condensing surface, right? It's made this surface cold and because it's a, you know, a biological material, uh, framing lumber, uh, this little fungus has uh, taken hold. Do you guys think there's anything to worry about here? There's always something to worry about. <laughs> <laughs> What would I you do, Mike? Destructive investigation, thorough, <laughs> thorough test. Sell the house. <laughs> Sell the house, move. <laughs> no, I, I, I think it's probably fine. Just mon monitoring can be, a, 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 you know, just keep an eye on things. You know, that's always, once, if anything you do, just keep an eye on it afterwards and just see that something doesn't uh, redevelop. Shouldn't we seal yeah, this early? Like Yes, I, I think it's, I think, you know, the situation here is that he's lucky, you know, he's got either some, he's got either air or, or water getting to this location somehow, and he's lucky that he doesn't have rot. So, but, but, but it's getting there. And so what he needs to do is figure out how the air and or water is getting there and take care of that. I think I'd cock that little joint first or put some air sealing tape on it and, uh, yeah, see what happens. Yeah. Andres, what do you think? Have you seen m mushrooms growing on your house ever? No, not mushrooms. Only outside, but not inside <laughs> the house. <laughs> <laughs> I one time was on a, uh, I was, was work, working on a project um, with a friend, uh, just kind of a contractor, and just kind of helping out, and we were doing, doing some demo on this house that had uh, ivy on the front of the house, like a stone foundation that, that came um, above grade on one, uh, part of the house and had all this really beautiful ivy and I was really like I was I was really taken by how how pretty it was and uh, interestingly we opened up the walls above the ivy on this project and it had it was the, the walls which were uninsulated um, and, and didn't have WRB on them or anything just board sheathing the walls were full of the ivy um, it had grown it didn't have any leaves on it and it in the in the stems were uh, they were just white um, I guess because it wasn't getting any sunlight but the walls were just like you know, full of the, this growth from the from the, how the ivy had gotten in and continued to grow. I guess going up and looking for the sun. What do you think the uh, R value is of uh, ivy stems? Uh, <laughs> in the, the well, is it English ivy or North American ivy? <laughs> <laughs> I, 
And so the thought of ivy on houses gives me a kind of visceral reaction. And, uh, you know, it is cool and pretty, but, oh, my gosh, it's probably a terrible thing to do to your house. You're nodding, Mike. You agree. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It, it, some people think there's charm in having that growing on the side of their house, which I guess if you're in England and, it's a, if, and the building is built out of stone, yes. perhaps that's the case. <laughs> but, but wood frame buildings with ivy on them are just a recipe for disaster. Yeah, I love it, though. I can't help it. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think it would grow on your steel siding, maybe? I don't know. <laughs> we might find out in a few years. <laughs> uh, this comes from Ben. I stole this question from Green Building Advisor because uh, I thought it was really interesting. Hey, all I am looking for some advice on a condensation problem I have in my house which is a 90s construction in Northern California. It's located about 10 miles from the coast. I have a lot of condensation on some of the older original dual pane windows on the west and north side the, through the winter months. If I don't mop it up every day, it pools and has con some, caused some surface mold. I originally it was just thought the windows that were old and needed to be replaced. Looking at the problem in some more detail, uh, the relative humidity is between uh, 45 and 65 percent through the year. I think being close to the coast and having misty mornings is contributing. I purchased a standalone 50 pint dehumidifier, which is running 24 7 and has 100 percent stopped this condensation and brought the relative humidity down. There are close fitting honeycomb shades on the windows. This has not helped the condensation issue. The crawl space does not have a vapor barrier. Luckily, the house is on the top of a hill, so water drains away very well. Originally, I was going to replace the five plus windows, but now I'm thinking there's a better plan. What I would do instead is install a vapor barrier on the crawl space, uh, install a whole house dehumidifier, uh, and leave the windows as they are. I welcome any thoughts on this. I haven't had to deal with condensation before. Thanks, Ben. Oh, Ben, I would say that's a good thing, <laughs> not having had to deal with condensation. Is this a real problem, fellas? What do you think? Well, it's, a, it's, a, it's an awesome question um, and one that, that I brought up to you, Patrick, the other day about sim – similarly brought up to you about, about my own house. Um, so, you know, condensation um, requires um, – what, what condensation requires – more importantly than the than the relative humidity and the temperature is the appropriate dew point temperature at a surface right so you you have you have a relative humidity level in your your house and then you have and, and that's relative to a temperature in your house and you calculate from those two things a dew point temperature and if the surfaces in the house are at that at or below that dew point temperature that relative moisture in the air is going to condense on that surface, right? So there's a, so like just using windows, sim simply using windows as an example, although it's oversimplifying because houses are more complex, but simply using windows as an example, if you have condensation on your windows, then you have a couple of options to cure that condensation. You can do something to, uh, uh, increase the surface temperature on the windows, which would either in, in which would likely either be in, installing higher performing windows or installing storm windows or something like that so that that interior surface of the window doesn't reach the dew point temperature or you have to lower the relative humidity um, which would which would make the dew point temperature um, higher right and therefore um, you, you would you would unlikely to have that have that condensation issue so those are the those are your two approaches to solving this problem but I think that the the interesting thing is that and and so okay, uh, a few more things to say. The interesting thing is that if you have this, if you have this condensing surface at your windows, good chance you have it in your walls too. So there's a good chance, unless you have a you know air barrier on the interior or vapor retarder on the interior that's preventing this uh, humid air and humidity from reaching the sheathing, you're likely having the same condensation issue on the inside of your of your sheathing, which could or could not present a problem down the road. You know, a lot of walls have condensation issues inside them and, you know, they have condensation at certain times of the year, they dry at other times of the year, they're just fine. Um, it's the walls that don't dry that aren't fine that you end up having mold or, or rot issues. Um, so all that said, you know, if you have a crawl space that is that is has really high humidity levels and has you know maybe even even water issues, then you want to cure that for many reasons. So there, that's a good place to start before you replace your windows to see what happens if you take care of um, if you take care of the crawl space. And then you know with 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 issues like that you know out of the way, 
um, then you can start to think about whether you know more dehumidification, um, which could happen through a dehumidifier or bringing in, I, I, depending on the climate zone, you know maybe bringing in out more outdoor air that could be if it's in the winter time, for example, outdoor air, cold air is drier air, so bringing in more air is one way to dehumidify the inside of your house. Um, so either dehumidification, more bringing in more dry air, or a combination of the two. Um, you, you, then, you know, then you can start to look at that. Uh, but first, you know, if you have, you know, if you have a basement that's not, uh, or a crawl space that is essentially outside, you know, running a dehumidifier, you're essentially trying to dehumidify outside. So, you know, first air sealing and insulating and taking care of that space, um, you know, that, that, that would be the first, the first thing that I would, you know, want to consider in a, in a situation like this. And it's inexpensive, right? Compared to replacing, uh, you know, modern windows, uh, yes. you know, you're, you're talking about some six mil poly and, uh, you know, a bunch of labor, right? What were you going to yes. say, Mike? So figure out where the moisture problem is coming from, why you have the higher humidity in the house in general. Solve that problem and it may eliminate the need for that dehumidification or reduce the amount of dehumidifying you need to do. Yeah. I was going to, um, a Ben's climate is a, uh, unusual one, I would say, right? Isn't coastal California, Northern California with its fog, uh, is going to be different than much of the rest of the country is my guess. Mm -hmm. Uh, something else, uh, related to your walls, Brian, of course, uh, you know, as I've mentioned on the podcast previously, Carol and I often talk about the questions we get to the podcast and building science because she has an interest in it. You know, Carol's question with, with regard, you were worried about moisture accumulation in your walls owing to your house uh, was 75 degrees heated from the sun and had 55% uh, relative humidity inside. I think most folks would say 55 is a safe number. But you're worried about moisture accumulation on the inside of your sheathing that would I presumably would be moving from the interior of the house through uh, vapor diffusion into the insulation and thereby condensing on the uh, sheathing because that's the coldest surface. Do I have that roughly uh, right, what you're worried about? Yeah. So, I mean, what you said, Patrick, about relative humidity, I mean, there's three, there's three things I think that are important when it comes to relative humidity. There's, um, the first one is uh, human health. Um, and there's there's a range right between you know often often cited between thirty and sixty percent relative humidity that is okay for human health and the closer you get to the center of that the better um, as soon as you get start to get towards the edges you push into areas where um, where it, where uh, the too high or too low relative humidity can cause or exacerbate our our, our health issues then there's comfort. And uh, I think it's, I think um, I read recently that, that ASHRAE, the, um, I don't know, all those air conditioning folks, um, whatever it stands for, um, I think they determined that people are most comfortable at 75 degrees with 50% relative humidity. So there's a, there is a, a known sort of point where, where our comfort and relative humidity align, but then there's the building. And then there's how relative humidity affects the building. So 50% relative humidity for me in the wintertime is great in my house, but it might not be great for my building be where, you know, because, you know, it's very cold outside and we have these condensing surfaces that, you know, where condensing surfaces being, again, where that dew point temperature is happening and 50% relative humidity at 75 degrees, uh, the dew point temperature is 55 degrees. There's certainly... The inside of my sheathing is certainly lower than 55 degrees. So I've had a little, I've had a, in the most extreme cases, I've had a little bit of condensation on my windows in this house um, over the last two winters. And um, I, I, but I know this problem in my house is that I, I have, I took a chance on a spot ERV and it's not bringing in enough. It, it had the flow rates that I needed for this house, but it doesn't distribute the, it doesn't distribute the fresh air around the house and it's not distributing, it's not bringing in enough and or distributing that, that outdoor, that dry outdoor air enough. Um, and I knew that I took a chance because it's a $500 appliance. And I thought if I need to put in an ERV, I, I, I didn't waste a ton of money. Um, but I think that's, I think what I'm going to do is install. Um, and well, also let me add, add to this discussion. So it doesn't just seem like I'm jumping the gun. I've also started monitoring the indoor air quality in the house and everything is great. 
except for um, carbon dioxide in our bedrooms in the morning, it spikes. And so again, we're not ducting that fresh air into our bedroom and three of us, uh, me and Amy and, and our dog are, sit, are in here breathing all night long. And um, maybe that's why I feel a little groggy this morning. <laughs> <laughs> so I am, I, I, yeah, go ahead. Patrick. I'm curious where the, 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 mo- the, the moisture would be coming from. The, the, you know, I'm, I'm surprised that it could move through your wall assembly with, uh, and quantities to condense on the sheathing, but maybe I am misunderstanding. You have painted walls. I believe you have a variable permeance uh, vapor retarder. Yes. Uh, so how the heck are these walls going to get wet enough to condense is my question. Well, they, it, it, they may not. And, you, you know, I, and I mentioned that when answering the, the original question. I mean, I, I, I do have, um, I do have a, in air and in, in, uh, vapor barrier installed, vapor retarder installed on the inside. I used membrane product, which is one of these so-called smart products, which allows for you know, vapor control when the conditions are right and some drying when the conditions are right um, or, or drying is called for. Um, so I may not have that issue. Uh, but I also think that, you know, between the, 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 you know, what I'm seeing while I while I monitor this between, you know, the fact that I have had a little, uh, you know, not not much, but last winter and this winter have had, you know, a little bit of condensation and the fact that we're not you know, we're not keeping carbon dioxide where it needs to be. I think I'm just coming to, you know, my own mistake, which was that this, you know, I, I should have installed a ducted, probably HRV if I want dry air in the house. If I want dry winter air in the house. That seems like a great fine home building article is installing a, a, an ERV in, in your house. It seems like a very uh, manageable project versus a much larger space with a, a greater complexity of floor plan. Have, have, do you have a route uh, planned out for well, that's stuff? Yeah, and that's one of the reasons, that's, that's the other reason why I was, a, I was willing to kind of take this uh, chance on um, the spot ERV. Um, and be, because I have a, an unfinished, a lot of the basement is unfinished and I have access to, I still have access to all the, you know, the floor system and can easily um, pop ducts up where they need to go. That sounds like a fun weekend project, cutting holes in your house. I can't wait. <laughs> Sign me up. <laughs> if you all have thoughts on Brian's humidity issue or Ben's, yeah. uh, I'd love to hear from you. It's, uh, I, I, I still feel like this is the newest building science issue we're trying to tackle, both on the podcast and in the larger uh, building world, right? It seems like air uh, movement and that kind of have... We figured that out, but vapor uh, concerns seem like to be the new thing to worry about. Do you guys agree with that statement? Yeah, and they are different in, it, you know, the, the tighter houses get, um, the, 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 it's changing things, right? You know, you didn't need to bring dry, cold air into an old, you know, nine, 1800s farmhouse in New England, um, but a house that even meets, you know, the, the uh, code requirements for air sealing you know, you've, you've changed the uh, equation on on how the house is going, you know, how the house is going to be in terms of dehumidification. And, you know, Emily Mottram uh, wrote a short piece for the magazine recently where she used the phrase HVAC plus D. And I said, Emily, what's this? And I had an idea, but I said, Emily, what's this? And she said, plus dehumidification. And, um, and we, you know, we added a little reference about that and she thinks, you know, that she's, she's feeling that, uh, pretty certain that, you know, throughout the whole country, we need to start to include, you know, uh, dehumidification and, and the loads, relative humidity loads on a house in, in our, you know, mechanical design. Oh, great. Something else, uh, HVAC <laughs> techs have to get a handle on. That's super. <laughs> Uh, this comes from Trisha. Hey, podcast. First, thanks for putting together such an informative show. I've learned so much from the podcast. One valuable tip I've learned from the show is to call support line to ask questions. I recently finished renovating a bathroom. I wasn't sure how to handle the new shower connection to the old cast iron drain line. I called the Sch- Schluter support line, and the very kind customer service rep helped me find a better solution. I can't stress that enough, and I don't know why people are call, scared to call manufacturers of stuff, but they're usually the best people to ask. Uh, second, my question. The air handler and furnace are in the attic of my 70-year-old house in Savannah, Georgia. Climate zone, hot and humid. 
Uh, the ducts to the bedroom have a short run to the registers at the top of the bedroom walls. The ducts to the living room, kitchen, dining room run down the crawl space and then out to the rooms with registers in the floor. I had the attic spray foam two years ago so the air handler and attic ducts would be in a conditioned space, which has helped a lot, especially in the summer. In the winter, the bedrooms get very warm, but the living room, dining room, and kitchen are almost 10 degrees cooler thanks to the long runs of duct work through the unconditioned crawl space. I'm thinking of running new ducts to the living room, dining room, and kitchen through the attic. These ducts will be in conditioned spaces and have shorter lengths, and I expect there will be less of a temperature drop from the bedrooms. My question is about the registers. Is there any reason I should not put the registers in the ceiling or high up on the walls other than aesthetics? It would be nice to be able to put furniture anywhere without blocking a vent and to never fish another Lego or a kid's toy out of a floor <laughs> duct. <laughs> but there could be building science factor to consider of or unintended consequences that I'm not thinking of. Thanks for any advice, Trisha. Trisha, this is a great question. Who wants to go mm -hmm. first? Oh, go ahead, Mike. You seem into it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess here uh, that as she mentions, the uh, air handler and furnace are up in the attic. So in order for there to be a duct down in the crawl space that's delivering the air to those uh, living room, kitchen, and dining where she's having the trouble. So that means there must be a vertical going down. So now you've, you, you're, you're adding to that uh, duct work. There's a tremendous distance from mm. whatever the, for the, the, for the, up, the units in the attic down vertically down to the, the lower level, below the floor, then across the lower floor. So she's right. Um, that, that's probably the reason, the long, long ducts, that you're not delivering the air to comfort, to, to make those rooms comfortable. So uh, I think her solution is, is simple, and I think it's going to be effective, is just cut in some, uh, redo the duct work up in the, uh, the attic so that you're delivering that air into those rooms directly through the attic. And I don't think there's going to be a problem running them through into the ceiling um, twofold. One is that uh, Savannah, Georgia, I'm going to uh, speculate that it's a cooling dominated climate. I think so that's a safe delivery... uh, assumption. <laughs> <laughs> so de delivering cool air in the summertime through those ducts uh, into the ceiling that naturally cooler air is going to tend to sink. It's preferred, um, whereas right? If you, you, you would rather yeah, it's have preferred uh, delivered. A cooling registers in the ceiling. Yep. And then he, if you were in a heating-dominated climate, theoretically, you'd want to deliver the air uh, through the floor, and then it would rise because warm air is a little more buoyant. Um, but that doesn't... The other part of it is that since you've done that air sealing or that the spray foam in the attic you've pretty much air sealed the whole lid of the house uh, and it, i found that in a fairly tight house uh, it doesn't really matter too much whether you're delivering your heating and or cooling through the ceiling or through the floor that the temperature stratification that you get uh, of the air, temperature of the air through the, the lower part of the floor up to the ceiling is not as dramatic in a tight house as it is in a leaky house um, so I think that you'd be fine delivering it into those rooms. You get the shorter duct runs, and you're going to be comfortable. So then there's no building science uh, issues with that. And you're not running the ducts through an unconditioned space, right? That is taking a huge hit on the air delivery temperature uh, to those uh, uh, the dining kitchen and living room, I believe it was. Yeah, that's. I think it's a great solution. Thing, it is, yeah. One thing she doesn't mention that we should – touch on is uh, if there's any, re what is the return ductwork situation? Mm. Um, if it's a central return versus a completely ducted return system, and that would be something as well that if it is currently a return system through uh, ducts in the crawl space, get rid of those. Uh, move those up into the attic as well uh, so that your return air is not subject to, as you're kind of alluding to there, Patrick, with the, you know, you're not sucking in uh, anything from an unconditioned space, sucking in uh, excess moisture or pollutants or mold that are down in the crawl space through the return ducts. 
uh, Trisha, I'm not typically a big fan of flex duck, but uh, you know, in, in short lengths, pulled tight, it works fine. I'm guessing that would make your work a lot easier up in the attic crawl space. Uh, and as Mike suggests, uh, roughly speaking, the uh, square inches of supply uh, grill should equal the return grill. So, uh, you know, do some rough calculations. And if you really want to get fancy, get an anemometer. Did I say that right? Uh, to uh, see what the air delivery is in the respective rooms before and after. And you're going to be able to pat yourself on the back for a job well done, is my guess. Yeah, send pictures and let us know how it works out. Seal your ducks, Tricia, while you're up there. If you're going to be crawling around, make sure you have a tub of uh, duck mastic or uh, some good butyl uh, tape and uh, do that work too because that will help with your air delivery also in more distant runs especially. Uh, this is another question from uh, GBA that I thought uh, was super relevant owing to the uh, incentives available for converting to a heat pump water heater if you're using a, a fossil fuel or resistance uh, water heating method right now. Um, this comes from uh, 4ZO Geo. We live in Chicago and have a four-story townhome. Our top floor is a small bedroom that has a louvered door utility closet with a gas furnace and gas water heater. The gas water heater is showing its age and probably needs to be replaced soon. I'd like to put a heat pump water heater in instead of replacing with another gas unit. I had one company come out to give a quote, and the estimator basically told me a heat pump water heater doesn't make sense in Chicago. Full stop. Everything I've read about heat pump water heaters says you should put them in a room with excess heat. Our top floor definitely fits that description due to a stack effect, especially in the summer. That location actually seems like an ideal place for a heat pump water heater, in my opinion. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this and whether I'm thinking about this the right way. Oh, and then one more thing. If a heat pump water heater does make sense, should we vent it to the outside? I'm thinking not, since we'd likely have to change the damper configurations with the seasons, which I very well may forget to do, and I'd like to avoid as many wall penetrations as possible. Looking forward to hearing your thoughts. What do you guys think? Heat pump water heater instead of gas in a bedroom closet? Yeah, I have a I have a question. Is you know we we um, there seems to be a lot of concern, theoretical concern about heat pump water heaters cooling the air, and you know um, there you know dehumidification is looked at as a positive, but then people get concerned about cooling, and you know I've even seen people crunch the numbers and talk about how it was going to you know lower the temperature or increase their heating loads. But to borrow a term from Ben Bogey and Dan Colbert, I wonder if this is one of those Yeti effects because as much as we as much as we hear about it from people asking the questions, I've yet to hear about it from someone who actually has an issue. I've yet to hear from someone who has installed a heat pump water heater and said, oh, this is the problem that it caused. But Mike's going to tell you he, he ducks his uh, uh, heat pump water heater seasonally. Am I right, Mike? You, you do uh, do this. Right, but I don't think that's the issue that Brian's pointing out, uh, or the non-issue that Brian's pointing out. Um, that's a, a separate thing, which is. Uh, but you don't you is, don't do that to keep from uh, uh, artificially cooling a space you're trying to heat. You do it for other reasons. Um, yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't think you need to duct it out uh, necessarily. I, I do it because uh, I. I it's more of an experiment. I just wanted to see what would happen if I could draw intake air to the heat pump from the outside. So when it's, say, 85 degrees outside and it's, like, say, 68 or 70 in my basement where the heat pump water heater is located, I could get better performance out of the heat pump water heater using the 85-degree outdoor air. But I don't want to necessarily and then in the winter i don't want to dump the cold air into the basement when it's up down to like say 64 63 degrees in the basement just because it's running the heat pump water heater so i ducked that colder air in the winter time to the outside um, and i'm fiddling with that at least on a monthly basis so it's just one of those, you know, nerdy things. It's that, a hobby. Um, it's not a necessity. Right? A, yeah, right. <laughs> and I think that, and I think that, you know, I think that's great. I mean, I've also, I know a jo Josh Edmonds, um, who's a who's a high performance pacifist builder in in upstate New York or midstate New York. Um, 
you know, he likes to create a, put the heat pump water heater in the laundry, in the same closet as the laundry, because the, he likes the, you know, the ex, excess heat from the unvented dryer, which in unvented dryers kick out a lot of excess heat. And so he, you know, he likes that heat, you know, to be able to be used by the heat pump water heater. Like go for it, make it work as efficiently as possible. But also I don't think there's any need to be concerned about like, you know, cooling or, I mean, they're, they're just in, in really, and I don't know about every climate, but to say that they don't, they don't make sense in Chicago, that's, that's silly. I mean, they just make sense. They're just an efficient way to heat water. Yes, they're more expensive, but they're an efficient way to heat water. They get fossil fuels out of your house. What do you think the ax this uh, plumber is grinding with saying that heat pump water heaters don't work in Chicago? What is, what is up with that? When the early ones came out, when they first came on the market, I remember going to a trade show in Boston where you couldn't even buy a heat pump water heat at the time, but you could buy these retrofit kits that would yeah. go on top of an old electric resistance system. And they were saying that uh, somebody had done some math. <laughs> it looked good on paper, but it, it basically showed like the northern tier of states where you got colder temperatures. They say it would not be cost effective. In other words, the payback period when you bought it uh, for what the upfront cost and then the operational cost, it was like you're better off sticking with natural gas or some, some other or electric resistance than going to the, buying these heat pump water heaters because it was scavenging heat out of the building in the wintertime. Um, and that was, you know, not necessarily, not necessarily going to cause a comfort problem, but it was just going to be a, a, a cost burden. Um, but I think the efficiency of the water heaters has gone up because they're no longer these retrofit things you put on top of a resistance hot water heater. They're built uh, to do that, to, to, to heat the water, um, you know, as one, one closed system. Um, but, yeah, they, they've pretty much shown that, that no matter what your climate is, at least in the lower 48, that uh, they make sense, even if you're scavenging some of your heat that you've paid to heat deliver into the house in the winter time and it's a no-brainer if you're in a cooling climate at all you know it's just like mm -hmm. do it if you haven't done it already do it tomorrow because the payback period is short especially with the incentives both state and federal I'm going to uh, offer two things based on, you know, uh, not efficiency or cost to heat water. But, uh, you know, I don't like the thought of gas appliances in a bedroom, really. Uh, you know, we have all heard about weird weather events that blow out pilots and, you know, modern uh, water heater, gas water heaters, I'm sure, are better than the old ones. But, you know, there are situations where the water heater doesn't know it's spilling exhaust gases. And, uh, you know, that can be toxic. Um, but the unfortunate fact of heat pump water heaters, as I understand it, is they make a lot of noise. So I don't know if I'd want that in my in my bedroom. Uh, you you're 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 not you disagree, Mike. It just makes it okay. So uh, I've recorded dozens and dozens of podcasts with you with my electric <laughs> heat pump water heater adja just adjacent to, I mean, within arm's reach of where I've been recording, and never once did Jeff ever say. What's that hum in the background? What do you think, Andres? Just... Is Jeff just too kind to point out Mike's noisy water heater? Is that what... <laughs> I was no, pointing it... it out, but I haven't heard anything. <laughs> no, it was it was just like a a, it's a hushed sound. I mean, it might be troubling to some people, but it's more of a hushed sound. It's like it sounds more like white noise maker. Like if you ever had one of those little white noise devices that just kind of has a, a hush sound that tempers down the the voices between rooms it, it's about as loud as one of those my tinnitus will drown the sound of that heat one pump water heater right <laughs> out i guarantee it you've lived with one of these brian did you find it loud i've lived with uh, a, a few of them now um i mean they, they make, you know they make some noise but in the you know the the first house that i installed one and we also had a you know we lived in a 700 square foot house with a big 
oil burning boiler. I mean, nothing, right. nothing was as loud as that when it came right. on. Um, so I, I, so I didn't think much of it. And then, you know, I mean, I think like all of these things make a little bit of, of sound, right? I mean, my, you know, mini split heads right up there, you know, when they come on, you, you hear it a little bit, you know, I hear the, you know, the ERV running in the other room. I hear my bath fan running right now. Um, and you know, it, it's not any more bothersome than any of, of these to me. And I mean, now I have it in a, you know, the one that we live with now is, is far away in the unfinished side of the basement. There's, you know, walls and floors and two doors between us. So we just don't hear it. Well, what? Go ahead, Mike. No, no, nothing. Ah. <laughs> I hope you all write in with your thoughts on heat pump water heaters, gas water heaters, or whatever is uh, on your plate for today or in the coming future. And uh, always send us your feedback because we love hearing from you. You guys have anything to add before we go? Uh, thanks, for, uh, thanks for listening. Thanks for all your feedback and questions. Someone send Brian Pontalulo a hobo data monitor, please, because I'm curious about the moisture accumulation. And he'll send it. If you send me an email or a podcast email, I'll give you the address. We'll send it right there. We'll know what he's doing. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's all the time we have today. Thanks to Mike, Brian, and Andres for joining me, and thanks to all of you for listening. Please remember to send us your comments, questions, and suggestions to FHB Podcast at finehomebuilding.com. And please like, comment, or review us however you're listening. It helps other folks find our podcast. Stay safe, everybody. Keep craft alive. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>